Hello and welcome everybody, my name is Elliot, and in this physics help room video, we're going to talk all about the buoyant force. I think just about every kid in a swimming pool has at some point tried to tackle something like a beach ball and force it under the surface of the water. But the harder you try to force the ball under the water, the harder the water seems to try to eject the ball back out. We'll understand why in this video. And we'll also learn to answer questions like how much of an iceberg is visible above the surface of the ocean and how much is lurking down below out of sight. Both of these questions come down to understanding the buoyant force, which is the force that a fluid like water exerts on an object that's floating in it. There's a beautiful and simple argument for understanding the buoyant force that goes all the way back to Archimedes over 2000 years ago, the great Greek mathematician. And so it's often called Archimedes principle. So let me explain the argument. So let's say we have a big pool of fluid. This could be something like a swimming pool, or the ocean, or a pot of cooking oil. And then suppose you rest an object on the surface of the fluid and it floats, like a rubber ducky on the surface of a bath. Say that the water is still and the duck is floating at rest. The duck, of course, has some weight, mg, pulling it down. But since it's sitting at rest, there must be an opposite force from the water pushing up on it. That's what we call the buoyant force, F sub b. In equilibrium, the buoyant force has to equal the weight of the duck. But how do we figure out how much of the duck has sunk below the surface of the water? And we know from experience that if you go and try to push the duck deeper down under the water, the buoyant force pushing back up is going to get even bigger. So how do we explain all that? The buoyant force is a lot like the normal force that a table exerts on a block that's resting on it. The actual microscopic origins of the normal force are very complicated. It comes from all the little atoms in the table bumping up against all the little atoms in the block. But when we zoom out, the macroscopic effect is very simple. There's a net upward force on the block that counteracts its weight and keeps it from falling through the table. Likewise, there are some very complicated interactions between the little atoms of the fluid, which bump up against the little atoms in the duct. But when we zoom out, there's a simple net result. The fluid exerts a pressure on the surface of the duct pressure meaning force per unit area, which means that there's lots of little forces acting on the duck, like all of these little arrows. And the sum of all those pressure forces equals the total buoyant force of the water on the duck. So here's Archimedes' beautiful argument for figuring out the buoyant force. We consider our pool of fluid again, but this time without the duck in it. I'll draw here the region where the duck had been, just as a reminder, and I'm going to highlight in darker blue the region of the fluid where the duct had been submerged. Let's call that volume V sub F, F for fluid. Let's write rho sub F for the density of the fluid, in other words, the mass per unit volume. If that's a constant, then the mass of this highlighted bit of fluid in dark blue is rho the density times V the volume, and so the weight is rho times V times G. The fluid is at rest. So this weight of the highlighted region pulling down has to be counteracted once again by all the little pressure forces from the rest of the fluid pushing on it. So all these little pressure forces have to add up to the total weight of the dark blue region of fluid, rho vg. That way, the total force will vanish and the fluid will be at rest. So that tells us that all the little pressure forces, represented by all the little arrows, have to add up to rho vg the weight of the region of fluid where the duck had been. Now let's put the duck back in the pool. The same total force is going to be exerted on its surface. So the buoyant force on the duck will be rho times v times g. In words then, the buoyant force equals the weight of the fluid that's been displaced by the object. As we expected, the buoyant force gets bigger if you force the object deeper down under the surface because F is proportional to the volume V of the object under the surface. And we also see that the denser the fluid is, the bigger the buoyant force is going to be. Now say we just rest the object on the surface of the fluid and it floats. So we're not trying to force it under or anything like that. Then as we knew from the beginning, by demanding that the buoyant force upward cancels out the total weight of the object downward, we know that the buoyant force has got to equal the weight of the object, mg. So we get an equation, mg equals rho vg. 
then we find that the volume of the object that sits below the surface of the fluid will be the mass of the object divided by the density of the fluid. Since rho sub f denoted the density of the fluid, let's let rho sub s denote the density of the solid object. If that density is a constant 2, then we can write the mass of the object as its density rho sub s times its total volume v sub s. Now, rubber duckies unfortunately don't really qualify here because they have a sheet of rubber around the outside and then the inside is full of air, so they don't have constant density. But instead, we might be talking about something like an iceberg floating on the surface of the ocean. Then, if we plug in our formula for the mass, we can write the volume of the object that sits underwater as the density of the object times its total volume divided by the density of the fluid. And so we can solve here for the ratio of the volume that's under the surface to the total volume of the object. And we find that it's equal to the ratio of the densities, the density of the solid divided by the density of the fluid. This is a beautiful result. It tells us how deep under the surface of a fluid that an object is going to sink when you float it on top. It also tells us something that you already probably knew. The object can only float if its density is less than the density of the fluid. Because if the density of the object is bigger than the density of the fluid, then this ratio becomes bigger than 1. But that's nonsense, because we were computing here the fraction of the total volume that sits under the surface of the liquid which can never be more than 100% of the total volume. So if the object is more dense than the fluid, it's going to sink down to the bottom. So why does an iceberg float on the surface of the ocean? And how much of the iceberg is actually lurking beneath the surface where you can't see it? Well, the density of liquid water is about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Actually, this is slightly different for ocean water because of the salt content, but let's just try to get a rough estimate here. When liquid water freezes, it expands. And therefore, the density of ice is smaller than the density of liquid water. It's about 920 kilograms per cubic meter. Then, if we use our formula to compute the fraction of an iceberg that's below the surface of the water, we get 920 divided by 1,000, which is 92%. Then about 90% of the iceberg is actually lurking underneath the surface of the ocean. So the tip of the iceberg that you're seeing from the side of a ship is only about 10% of the whole structure by volume. So definitely steer clear. Another question that you can ask yourself is, if you take a glass of water with some ice in it and measure the height of the water level, and then wait for the ice to melt, will the water level have gone up, gone down, or stayed the same? Think about that, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel because I'll post another video about that problem very soon. Otherwise, that's it for this video. As usual, I'll put a link down in the description to the notes that I wrote up, which you can get for free on my website. Please hit the like button, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.